Good afternoon, everyone. Our next presentation is Introducing Incompatible Changes in Python uh, by Victor Stinner. Victor is the senior software engineer at Red Hat. He maintains Python upstream and downstream, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora. He has been a Python core developer since 2010. In this presentation, he's going to tell us how Python introduced incompatible changes and the project dealing with these changes. Let's welcome Victor. So hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm Victor Stina, and I'm going to talk about Python incompatible changes. So my name is Victor Stina, and as um, uh, was, it was just said, I'm maintaining Python upstream, which means that Python dot work, and downstream, which are the Fedora and Red operating system, and I'm doing that for Red Hat. Upstream means that I'm fixing regressions, I'm paying attention to the CI, to the build box, and I help others to fix regressions. And downstream means, for example, to backport security fixes or some, some of the most important bug fixes. I'm a core developer for 12 years, so it means that I saw many incompatible changes in the last 12 years, and I'm a happy Fedora and BIM user. So, to start, I would like to come back in the past, in, um, in the Python 2 era, and uh, we will see uh, what is a D-Day API migration. And the idea of this picture is that um, the DDA migration made the Python com community upside down. So a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was something called Python 2. So please come with me and travel 15 years ago in the past, before Python 3. So before Python 3, uh, the only Python version was Python 2, and uh, we got a problem called the Unicode errors. In the Python 2 era, the Django project started to become more and more popular, and it became a real competitor for PHP framework and Ruby on Rails. But uh, one of the most common issues in Django was to handle Nonansky characters. Nonansky is uh, any letter with a diacritic or any characters which is not part of the Latin alphabet. And for people living in Taiwan, I, I guess that you already heard about this kind of issue. So it was not only about Django, but basically any Python user was affected by this issue. And it was a very frequent question to, to how to handle Unicode errors. So to explain you the issue with Python 2, for the one who only know Python 3, in Python 2, the basic string ABC is not a Unicode string. It's a byte string. So it made of numbers. And um, the issue with that is that you don't know the encoding of the string. It can be Latin 1, it can be UTF-8, it can be anything else. So when you would like to just concatenate two string, one by string and one unicode string, Python, Python tools uh, tries to be nice with you and try to automatically convert the by string to unicode by decoding the string for from ASCII. And for example, on this short example, you concatenate two non-ASCII string, you get a unicode error because the first string is a by string and it cannot be decoded from ASCII. And getting Unicode correctly in Python 2 was very complicated because uh, the automatic uh, conversion from bytes to Unicode and there was no um, error uh, raised when you do such, uh, such thing. And also because um, bytes was not, uh, sorry, the Unicode was not a first class citizen, you had to opt in for Unicode. So the good news is that Python 3 decided to fix the root issue of that. So Unicode became a first-class citizen, 
For example, the, the same string ABC is now a Unicode string. And the nice thing with that is that when you concatenate two strings, there is no encoding anymore. All is Unicode and it's, it's just fine. But um, the issue with that is that when you take an application written for Python 2 and you migrate to Python 3, it's very painful because you have to handle all of these bytes versus Unicode issues at once. You cannot uh, do an incremental uh, migration because as soon as you start the application, you get immediately an error. You concatenate bytes and Unicode. So in the early days of Python 2, uh, we got two new protocols in Python 2.2. The so first one is uh, iterator, which is a very generic way to iterate on any kind of container. And we also got um, iterator is a pep 234. And the generator, which is a way to generate the value and on demand. And the nice thing with generator is that you don't have to compute all of values in advance. You generate the value as you are consuming the generator. So in memory, there is a single item, in fact. And generators come from the PEP255. And um, if you look at the built-in function of the Python 2 map on zip function, you, you get a list when you call this function. And the issue with that is that if the input containers is very large, you put all the results in memory and it can consume a lot of memory and you get the same issue for map and zip. So it was very common on forums on the, from co-workers and from others to get the advice of migrating from map and zip to IMAP and IZIP from the ITR tools modules to explicitly create a generator instead of getting a list. But the issue with that is that you, you have to teach to everybody to to move from the old API to the new one, and you need to import a specific module. So it's not the natural way of doing things in Python, because map and zip are built-in functions. And if you look at the one of the most um, critical type in Python, the dictionary, there is a method to iterate on um, items, so method called items, which create a list of pairs, uh, key key value pairs. So in Python 2, you get a, a list. And if you want to get an iterator, you have to call explicitly a separated function called the iter items. So again, the good news is that in Python 3, all you need to do is just to call map and zip. And by default, you get a generator. And it's the same for the items module of dictionary. Instead of getting a list, you get a generator. So again, it's more efficient. It's a, it's a good practice to do, use generator. And if you really need to get a list, all you need to do is to call a list on a generator. For example, call a list on dict.items. And I think this is a better way to do things. But the problem, again, is the, the migration. Because if you migrate an application from Python 2 to Python 3, sometimes the result of map on, or zip or item is not consumed to iterate on a loop, but it's used to, to do some operations. And the code makes the assumption that the result is a list. So when you migrate from Python 2 to Python 3, you have to, be, to pay attention to that. So Python 3 um, is a new language somehow, and the Python language evolved as Python 3 to get a same default behavior. So as I say, to use Unicode by default, to create generators, to implement the iterator, um, iterator protocols on all built-in types. And thanks to these changes, the whole language becomes consistent again. But the big issue with that is that uh, compared to Python 2, Python 3 is backward incompatible.
So the question is, why do we need incompatible changes? So to try to explain to you why we made these changes, there is a PEP20, which is called the Zen of Python. And it says that there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. It means that you, when you write Python code, you can expect that uh, two different persons write similar code, have a consistent coding time. And thanks to that, it's easier to teach and easier also to review code because you pay less attention to the coding style, to how the function is implemented. And you can really focus on the, um, on the logic and not really on what I would call the coding style. So this is um, something specific in Python, and, and it seems like many people like it because Python has been, has been chosen by many schools around the world to actually uh, teach programming for people who are new to programming. So what was the plan to migrate from Python 2 to Python 3? Actually, the, the plan was very simple. The idea is that there is a tool called 2 to 3, so migrate from Python 2 to Python 3, and everybody was told to just run the application 2 to 3 on the code base at once to make it compatible with Python 3. So all you need to do is just run the 2 to 3 and you're done. It didn't went so well uh, because of different issues. The first one, uh, dependencies, because if you port only your own code, you cannot run the application if a single dependency is not compatible. And sometimes a dependency has itself new dependencies, so you have to check all dependencies and check which one should be ported first, and port the first uh, dependencies and move to the next one. And it took a lot of time to, to get all dependency ready, for Python 3 before you could even consider porting your code to Python 3. The other big deal was that uh, maintainers wanted to keep Python 2 support because dropping support for the Python 2 didn't make sense. It was just the most widely used Python version. And for all these reasons, the migration didn't take a single day, it took 10 years. To try to explain you the, the D-Day approach, I found an interesting story about Swindon. At Swan, in Swindon, in one day, they decided to, to switch from driving on the left-hand side of the road to the right side. And this day is called Dagen H, which means day, day H. So they took the decision in 1963 and the migration was made in 1967, so they had four years to prepare the change. To, to imagine the consequences of the change, just for the, for the sign on the road, it's uh, more than 300,000 of signs which have, had to be removed or replaced. And just in the city of Stockholm, it was about 20,000 signs. It's not only about science, it's also about uh, getting bus with the entry on the right side, so you, they had to buy new bus. It's also about moving the bus stop and also um, getting trams, tramway with the door on the proper, proper side. So it was a lot of changes which had to be prepared a while in advance and happen at the same day. Oops. So to communicate on the change, they decided to write a logo. And actually, I like it because you can see on the logo that you come from the left, you go to the right. And the, the numbers below are, are just the date of the actual change. So the 3rd of September. And this is funny. They, they found a way to communicate about the change. So they decided to start selling the wear on stocks with the logo and the intent was 
was to communicate on that channel, so most people are, are aware of it. So it was a little bit surprising for me, but why not? Maybe we should uh, consider to do that for the Python 2 to Python 3 immigration. Maybe we can find ways to educate people. And there was a um, Swedish uh, television who organized a contest of a song to, to communicate on this um, change. And the winner is uh, Keep the Right Swen Swenson. You can Google for it with the name in Swedish below. And um, again, I think it's a, it's a good way and maybe we, we can find new approaches for, for the delay. So how did they manage to do the actual, actual change? They did, decided to ban the non-critical traffic for one day. And what they did is that for 10 minutes, you were not allowed to drive. All you had to do is just to move from the left to the right. And everybody in the population was ready for that change and they communicated a lot in that change. So to come back to Python, uh, there is also something called the C API. So for people who are not aware of it, the C API is used by many third party extensions to extend Python. Because in Python, you can do many things, but you cannot do everything. And in the C language, uh, the great advantage is that you can reuse existing C code, access uh, libraries which are written in C. And the C API is, um, is a glue between the C world and the Python world. And the C API is a big part of the Python success. Without the C API, there is no NumPy, for example. There is no Cython, there is no PsychoPG2, the driver to access PostgreSQL and database. And if, just if you remove NumPy, you remove all the scientific stack, which is very popular in Python. You remove machine learning, you remove everything, you just get, get the language. You don't have all the ecosystem again around um, Python. So in Python 3.11, which is uh, scheduled for next October, there are a bunch of uh, C API incompatible changes. And these changes are driven by the work on optimizing Python 3.11. And uh, the most affected uh, structures are the ones which are used to execute Python code. So the PyCode object, the PyFrame object, and the PyThread state structure. And the problem is that some C extensions uh, access directly members of the structures. To update the C extensions, you have to make changes like that. For example, instead of accessing directly the F underscore code member, you have to call a function, so PyCall underscore get code. And for the frame, instead of getting the F underscore back member, you call PyFrame get back. And same to get the frame attrib attributes from a, from a thread state, you have to call py thread state get frame. And the issue with this change is that if you use a new function, you lose compatibility with all Python version because it's um, there are new functions part of Python 3.11. Another way is to add the conditional code. Depending on the version, you use the old way or the new way. But usually, people don't like to do that because it makes them code more variables harder to maintain. So let's move back to the present and let's see how to have smoother API updates. So about Python 3, the 2 to 3 approach didn't work, but um, there, there, there was a new module called the 6. And this one is really interesting. Instead of having to decide between Python 2 and Python 3, it's a, a way to write a single code base working on the old Python version and the new Python version. So with a single code base, you can support Python 2 and Python 3. So it means that instead of running 2 to 3, which remove Python 2 support, you add support for Python 3, the new Python version. 
So the new migration approach becomes to port the code incrementally. You don't have to port all the code at, at once because since you, you, still, you are still compatible with Python, Python 2, you can do it, for example, by module per module or file, file per file. And you can test your code in Python 2, you can check for regression. It's way more practical for even especially for a large code base. And in short, the delay approach was abandoned because it didn't work. It was just too complicated to implement. So the good news is that we learned from the delay approach and we, we try another way to introduce uh, uh, incompatible changes in Python. So two, two years ago, we did also something new. We reverted some incompatible changes in Python 3.10. So to put these changes in context, uh, two years ago, the, the support for Python 2.3 just ended upstream. It was something very new, but many third party projects still supported Python, Python 2 because it was still popular and um, they didn't want to lose users. So even if they had a plan to migrate to Python, Python 3 and drop support for Python 2, they still wanted to support both um, just because it takes time to communicate with users and update the code to, support, to remove the Python 2 support. So about the change in Python 3.10, there were two changes which were breaking tons of uh, projects. The first one is a removal of the U mode of the open function. The, this one is, is really, really trivial because it's just a flag which is in your in Python 3. It is just useless. But tons of code, of existing code, legacy code, were still passing the flag, even if the flag doesn't mean anything. And using the flag emits a deprecation warning, by, but by default it's not displayed. And the second one was the removal of the collection's ABC aliases. So instead of getting the ABC, the, the abstract base class from the collections modules, you're supposed to get it from the collection.abc submodule. The problem with this um, removal is that it became way more difficult to write a single code base supporting Python 2.7 and the new 3.10. And it was a little bit surprising to have to modify your code to support to keep support for Python 2, because everybody wanted to get rid of Python 2, which was no longer supported upstream. So it was decided to to revert this removal and uh, do this removal again, but in the next Python version, so one year later. And the purpose of all these reverts is to, to give more time for people to update their code base. And the rationale was that it just broke too many, too many codes. In Python 3.11, we did something similar a few months ago. We noticed that uh, free changes caused a lot of troubles. The first one was the uh, old methods of the unit test module. On a test class, a test uh, test case, sorry, you had uh, different names of methods, which are aliases for new methods, but many, many projects are still using the old names. And even if it, it does emit a deprecation warning, people didn't pay attention. All of these changes that I'm talking about were deprecated for many years. There was It was deprecated in the documentation. It emits a deprecation warning when you use it, but people did not notice or didn't want to pay attention. The second change was a config parser, which also uh, had an old API. And the old API, the deprecated one, was just removed. And the third change was the removal of the wall async core mod module. It's not only about this one, it's async core, async chat, and SM SMTPD. So it was decided to revert these three changes because again, it caused 
too many troubles, it broke too many packages. And again, the idea is to postpone these changes in the next Python version, so 3.12, and give more time to people to, to fix it. Um, another thing that, that changed two years ago is that uh, instead of having one, and, one year and a half to release a new version of Python, it was decided to make the release cycle shorter and to have one Python release per year. That's the PEP 602. So since 2020, which means Python 3.9, there is one Python version per year. So we got 3.9 in 2020, 3.10 in 2021, and this year we will get 3.11 in 2022. So because the release cycle became shorter, the old backwards compatibility policy um, was too short for deprecation because previously it was only one Python release to deprecate um, a change. We wanted to extend the deprecation to two years. So the PEP 387 was updated to require to deprecate a function for at least two years, which means two Python releases. And for example, the deprecation, uh, if you want to remove a, a function, you deprecate the function in Python 3.11. It's still deprecating this in the next Python 3.12. And you have to wait the third version, so 3.13, to remove the function. So removing anything in Python takes at least three years. To come back to the deprecation line, this is something important about incompatible changes. It was decided in Python 2.7, so 12 years ago, to hide these warnings by default. The thing is that most users of Python are real users, people who are using application. And the developers are only a small, small group of people. And if a user gets a warning like deprecation warning. It's really difficult, really difficult to get right of this warning because you have to modify the code. And for example, on Linux, you are not allowed to modify the code on a, of a project. You need the root permission and you may not even be allowed to modify the code. So it was decided to hide the warning by default. But the new issue is, is that Developers didn't pay attention, so they are not aware that Python, Python 3 emits many deprecation warnings. So a small change was uh, in Python 3.7. The deprecation warnings are displayed by default in the main module, because the main module can be, for example, when you write your own script. And when you write your own script, you get a warning because we expect that you are allowed to modify your script. To, dis to display these warnings, you can pass the dash uppercase W default. In that case, the warnings are displayed once. Or if you want a strict mode, you can pass dash W uppercase W error. In that case, it does raise an exception. Or you might want to try something called the Python development mode. It's dash uppercase X dev. This is something that I introduced in Python 3.7 to enable not only warnings, but only different things that, which are useful to developers, but not to users. So you have to opt in for this function. And some of these uh, functions are, uh, makes Python a little bit slower, which is fine to develop Python, but to, to use Python, usually when you want to get the, the most perform best performance. So what can we do to get a smooth deprecation? So first part is obviously to add the new API. And if you want a smooth deprecation, what you can do is to only deprecate in the documentation because this is not impacting anyone. It's only something uh, in the documentation and people uh, who are developing in Python, they can check the documentation for warnings and prepare their code within 
uh, without being affected by um, deprecation warning emitted at runtime. So the first step is to start to emit deprecation warning. And we do that for at least two, uh, two Python days. And something which is new uh, that we started to do in the last two years is that when, you when we deprecate a function, we are trying to explain how to update existing code without losing support for the old Python version. So there should be a way any, with any kind of solution to write code supporting the old Python version and the new Python version. In practice, usually you use the old API on the old Python version and the new API on the new Python version. And it can be an external project which are providing the, the new functions to the old Python. It can, you can imagine different solutions. But we have to think about that uh, because um, introducing incompatible changes in Python is easy, but we, we have to pay attention to users. We are listening to users and we are trying to help them to, to adapt their code to this new API. So when you did all the steps, here you can remove the new API. And something that I did in my team uh, last year is to run code charge. So when you are working on an incompatible change, or when someone else merged a uh, change which is known to be incompatible. What I do is to first uh, download the source code of the PyPI top 5,000 projects. And I wrote a script called the charge PyPI top, uh, which, is, um, which can be used to charge for code pattern using regular expression. And thanks to that, I'm able to, to list the affected projects in the top 5,000 most popular PyPI projects. And this is, um, this is very useful for me because it gives an estimation of how many projects are affected. And it also gives um, a hints of how you are supposed to update your code. Um, what I'm trying on my side is to try to help people to update their projects. And as I said, it's also helping me to explain in the Python documentation how to, how to update your code. And if you have to, to keep a single slide in my whole presentation, this is the most important one. This is the ideal migration according to me. So the ideal migration starts by adding a new API, obviously. Do write documentation to explain how to update the code, or if possible, that would be even better, to provide a tool to update your, your, your code. So to run an automated tool so people don't have to do this um, job of detecting the affected uh, function and modify the function one by one. Then you, if, if, if you introduce an incompatible change, it's good to try to identify and update the affected projects. This is a bit nice for the Python community. Instead of uh, breaking um, many popular dependencies, try to prepare the ecosystem so, so the migration will, will be very smooth and nobody will notice the migration because uh, the ecosystem is already ready for that. So it's not only about updating the project, it's also about waiting for re actual release, including the fix. So release uh, compatible with the new API. And uh, then you can start to deprecate the old API. This is the ideal way. You wait until everybody is ready before even considering to deprecate the old way. And you wait for two Python release and then you can finally remove the old way. The disadvantage of this method is that it takes time between three and five years. And sometimes people want to move faster. So sometimes they start by deprecating, deprecating the old API and they only wait for new releases after the old way is already deprecated. 
And one issue with the with the um, incompatible changes is that they are unmaintained projects. So what are those? So some core Python dependencies have a single uh, maintainer who is not available for different reasons. And you can think about many good reasons to not be available. For example, the maintainer can be busy with work, have life duties, maybe the priority changed in life or work, they can be bored, they can become sick. And um, I don't like the expression about the best factor because this makes the assumption that the only way to lose a maintainer is a fatal bus accident. But this kind of event is very unlikely. But if you think about getting sick, uh, getting a new, a new job or moving to a new team at work or getting new life duties, this is something very common, in fact. And here the question becomes how to update the project when the maintainer doesn't reply. And sadly, this is, this is still an open question today. And um, more and more people are aware of this issue because um, there are more and more people relying on a popular uh, Python module to not have to rewrite the code by themselves. And it's also the question of uh, funding. How can we fund the maintenance of these projects? How can we help this project? Is it a lack of money? Do we need to pay someone to help these maintainers? I don't know, honestly. And I was a maintainer of a popular project and I decided to give up because of the because of the maintenance burden, because I only got um, emails from people who are angry, who want a quick fix. They consider that they are very important because they are earning a lot of money with my project. And I was supposed to be more motivated if they are earning more money, but I was not paid to do that. I did that in my free time for free. I never get any, any money for that. So this is really a thankless walk. The other issue with incompatible changes is what I call the hidden projects. So projects which are behind closed doors. You can, you can say in general projects which are not published on the internet or projects which are not published on PyPI. You can think about very short scripts of a few lines but there are very, very large applications which are cloud source um, application of big companies which are written in Python and you are not aware of this. So you code, you don't have access. So it's difficult to know which projects are affected and it's um, not easy for us as Python code developers to know how to help this application because we don't have access to this. You can think about all projects also, uh, which are no longer maintained. And in practice, uh, if you think about um, an application in a company, there is an issue of turnover because customers always want your product. They have new use cases, and they want to they want to get it get it fast. So once an application is shipped. Usually there is way less people and less money to maintain the whole code. So it's a common issue in, in computer science to get all projects which are no longer maintained and projects behind closed doors. So what can we do for this project? Um, I like the design of the tool called PyUpgrade. I'm not sure if it's already ready to use, but at least it's very useful for um, to implement uh, migration because there is a way to keep support for all Python version and support the, the new Python version in the same code base and all of these changes are automated. So this is for Python code and there is a script called upgrade Python C API which can, can be used for C Python as uh, for C the C API so for C extension and I will tell you more about that later. And this is an automated tool for C extension. You just have to run the tool and 
just the extensions becomes compatible with the new Python. In the, in the last case, if, if there is no other choice, there is always the option of keeping an old Python version. But now the problem becomes security because the old Python versions are no longer maintained and maybe you will get um, security issues. Maybe you can use a professional Linux distribution like RHEL to get very long support. For example, at, at Red Hat, we are still supporting Python 2 for at least two years. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue. So I told you about the CIPI changes made in Python 3.11, which makes it complicated to write a single code base for the new and the old Python. So I spent time to think about this issue and try to find a practical solution. So what I did is that I created a project two years ago, which is providing new functions, like functions of Python 3.11, to old Python version. So there is a thin layer, compatibility layer, will provide the same functions with the same name, but the implementation is using the old way of doing things. And the good advantage of that is that you have a single code base using the new way, so like the Python 3.11 API. And all you need to do is just to copy a, a short end of file in your project. So two years ago, I created the project. After that, I wrote the upgrade Python C API script, which is the one that I told you about. You just run the script and your extensions becomes compatible with the new Python. Last year, I added support for Python 2. Uh, even if Python 2 was no, is no longer supported upstream, uh, Mercurials still care about supporting Python 2, and I wanted to support Python 2, Python 2 to be able to use Python C API in Mercurial. And it was a success because I tried using it. And um, this year I added support for Python 3.11. And I think that this approach is successful because 10 projects are using it. So as I said, you, you can update your C extensions to, new, to use the new functions. You just copy the header file and you get compatibility with all Python version up to Python 2.7. And there is no need to update the header file unless you need new functions. Another change that uh, we made in Python is to design guidelines because the C API has some flaws and it makes it um, inefficient on other Python implementations. So we would like to fix this flow, but it's not difficult to fix the flow without breaking the C API. So what we did is to design a few guidelines to at least prevent the issue in new code. So in new functions, you, you must not return borrowed references, but strong references. And you must not steal references on function arguments but just uh, add a new reference in your code. You also have to well define the ownership rules and lifetime of arguments and structure members. This is something very important in C to know when a pointer is still valid and when the pointer must not be used anymore, for example. We also reorganize the header files to have a clear separation because what's called the limited C API or the stable IBI, so public CIPI, which is a common one that you are using, and what's called the internal CIPI, which is the one who is only used by Python itself, and sh you should not use it unless you know what you are doing. So in my team, what we are doing is to test Python 3.11 as soon as possible, to report issues to Python upstream, and we are doing that since the first alpha version of Python. And the point of uh, reporting issues as soon as possible is that you get more time to redesign the new API, to, to spend more time of thinking how to update the code, and it's more pleasant to not be stressed by a feature freeze or final release. So in practice, what, what we are doing is to replace Python 3.10 by 3.11, and rebuild the whole um, 
all, all Python packages of the Fedora. And uh, it's a lot of work because usually uh, on 5,000 uh, package, you get at least 200 broken packages and you have to find which one is causing the other failures. So we have to go through the logs, check what is the root issue and try to contact the Python, the affected project to contact upstream to at least report the issue. Or if possible, we are trying also to prov provide a fix. So it's a work of collabor a collaborative work between Fedora, which is called the downstream um, upstream project to help them to migrate to the new Python. So, so to summarize what was done in the last years is that we are proactively charging for affected projects. We are trying to well document how to update code without losing support with old Python version. We are trying to help affected projects to be compatible. And the nice thing is that actually helping this project is a better insight on how to update the code. And there is a Fedora project on my team uh, who is providing early feedback. And for the CAPI, there is a new compatibility project, the PyCI API Compass. So let's see how we can do for the future. Maybe we can design better API. So to come back to the CAPI, because I care a lot about the CAPI, there is something called the stable ABI. So the idea is that you build your C extension only once, and the, the binary is compatible with uh, all Python version. You don't have to build the C extensions for each Python version. This is an old feature since Python 3.2. And uh, the way of using it is that you have to opt in for what's called the limited C API, which is a subset, but it should be large enough to, to do many, many things in Python. So what changed recently is that there is a PEP 652 by my colleague Peter Victorin, who is about, which is about maintaining the stable ABI. And the first great enhancement was to document this API and ABI because um, only a few people understood that. And we also added new tests for the ABI. You want to make sure that what is announced is actually available. Another change that we did last year is that once we ship a new Python version, we make sure that the ABI doesn't change. So this, this specific change is not about the stable ABI, but it's about the whole ABI in, in general. So once Python is released, by default, you cannot uh, merge a pull request if, it's, if it does uh, change the ABI. But if you can explain it to the release manager, maybe you can get an exception. And um, if you explain that it's not affecting users and the release manager is OK, you can match a pull request. And so the stable ABI, for example, is used by the cryptography and the PySide project to, to ship binaries on PyPI for all Python versions. Again, for the C API, instead of uh, trying to fix issues one by one, which can be very slow, there are people who decided to design an, a brand new C API. And the design of the API is to make it efficient on PyPI, but it's also efficient on C Python. For example, they made a proof of concept on the micro JSON module, and they proved that it can become three times faster on PyPI, faster than using the old way, so the, the C, Python, C Python C API. And the nice thing about this project is that you can also build um, something called the universal ABI. So you build your C extension once, and it's compatible with all C Python version and PyPy version, which is very convenient. And the largest known C Python extension is NumPy, and there is a work in progress port to HPy, which is quite interesting. So just to finish, um, I would like to ask you to do something for me. Please 
try to test the nightly build of Python in your CI, because nowadays more and more people are testing the, uh, the project automatically, and and they want to to check for regression as soon as possible. And if you are able to run your test suite on the nightly build, what you can do is to discover issues early. You can report them to CPython, and again, if we get the information early, we can spend more time to design a better API, to better explain how to update the code, and maybe even help you to update your code. And if possible, even start at the very first alpha version of Python. So for example, in next October, we will get Python 3.11. And at the same time, you will get the first alpha version of Python 3.12. So thank you for listening. And I'm now waiting for your question. Thank, thank, thanks, Victor, taking us through the galaxy journey of incompatibles. Um, here is a slide of um, Victor. Can you see it? We have four questions. And, okay. fir and first question is: So, in alternative universe, we could have gotten Python logo underwear as conference swag. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. <laughs> um, I think we could do that for the Python two to Python three migration. But sadly, the migration is over. We already migrated to Python 3, so it doesn't make sense. And even if it's funny, I would prefer that we don't have a new D-Day migration. And honestly, I would prefer incremental updates because it affects less users and it makes less people unhappy. And the second question is, regarding to the C API change, do the code diverse 2.2 high mode struck internals so future changes to the fields will be easier? Upper, upper uh, yeah. pointers? So this is a hot topic. Uh, to try to explain that. Uh, currently, the CAPI is um, leaking many implementation details. And because of that, it becomes um, complicated to optimize Python. And it's uh, inefficient on PyPy for example, because uh, the fact that it, we are leaking uh, implementation detail of the current C API, C, C Python implementation, uh, it's very inefficient to, to have exactly the same API on a, on a different Python implementation like PyPI or Gural Python. So this is why the HPI project was um, designed to provide a new, brand new API. And uh, there is a work in progress on CPython to step by step trying to hide implementation detail. And I'm conducting this change for five years. So this is why also I'm involved in incompatible changes and trying to find a path to smooth migrations to the new C API because I want to fix these issues and I want to hide implementation details. But I am paying a lot of attention to users' feedback, and I want I don't want to lose Python users. So we have to find the right balance between evolving the C API and not making too many people unhappy. Okay, the third one is: Is it a different decision to make? reverse changes, one remove again in next version. Is there any discussion or even complaints about this? Um, so yeah, I said that uh, twice we, we reverted changes in uh, Python. I expected uh, a very long discussion and a lot of complaints. And the thing is that there are two groups of people. There are people who want to to follow the zone of Python, of having a single way to do things. And they want to move fast. They want to make Python consistent, which makes Python easier to teach, easier to review, as I said. And the second group uh, are more people who have a large code base, and they have a small team maintaining the, the, the project. So keeping 
keeping the technical debt low is expensive for such things because they don't have the money, they don't have the resources for that. So there are the two two policy in Python and it's impossible to make everybody happy. What we are trying to do in Python in general is to find a consensus to make the, the lowest number of people unhappy. Um, but to, re to come back to your question about reverting, uh, for these changes, uh, now we have, have um, a group of people called the Steering Council, a group of five, five people taking decision. And I think in that case, all rever reverts were decided by the Steering Council. And the good thing is that once they provide a, an answer, we just follow what they say and the discussion is closed. Okay, next one is, since someone would always complain no matter how much you delay, how can we decide how much time is enough for the community to migrate? Uh, this is a tough question. They are always unhappy people. If you break a single project and this and users of this project uh, can be very loud, they can make a lot of noise on Twitter, on the mailing list, come to physical events to protest. You have no idea how people can be very angry against a very small Python change. And um, we, we already, already got that multiple times. And the issue is becoming more and more serious because the number of Python users is growing. The popularity of Python is growing. So this issue is not going to disappear and we will get more and more people protesting. So we have to find um, a balance between breaking Python and keeping the backward com compatibility. And as I said, there is a duality between new features and stability. But I think that uh, we made great progress in the last years to, um, to provide practical solutions like documentation, tooling, projects to make it easier to have a single code base working on old and new Python version. So there, there is a way to, to continue moving on. And for me, the main risk is to listen too much to people who protest because uh, there are always people protesting. And if, you, if, if we decide to not modify Python anymore, something like Python 2.7, maybe Python will not uh, fit to new use cases. Maybe we will lose some users because if we are not uh, supporting new use cases, people will just switch to another project another stack, another programming language. So we, we have to go through this painful, incompatible changes. So the, the thing is that we have to, but maybe we can find a way to, to minimize the number of unhappy people by writing documentation tooling and things like that. Okay. I think we are running out of time, but we probably have time for one more question. Uh, okay. Is wondering if there is some practical ways to handle unintended project update or fix, or projects with or without also replies? So about unmaintained uh, projects, in short, um, the problem is about code that you cannot modify. The, um, I proposed uh, a solution, it was called the Python compatibility version. So to run Python in a compatibility mode, so the new Python behaves uh, as the old Python. But the PEP was immediately rejected. I think it was 602, no 606, something like that. Uh, the problem is that um, it would be very expensive on, on the Python side to, to maintain this compatibility layer. And the new problem becomes uh, make, making sure that one project, like for example NumPy, 
is compatible not only with the new Python, but with all compatibility versions. For, for example, Python 3.12 running uh, as a 3.10 compatibility mode. So this approach didn't, didn't work. Uh, another approach would be to automate the migration of uh, code base. So you pick a code and you run a tool which makes, makes it automatically compatible with the new Python. That may be possible, for example, when you install the code to automatically update it. And we have something like that in set of tools. It was possible to, during the installation, to convert the Python 2 code base to Python 3. And there, there are ways to, for example, using the PyUpgrade uh, design to, to make it compatible. OK. Uh, let's give the big hand to you. And we still have two more questions. Would you come to the Gather Town and okay, to sure. answer these two questions? And for those you still have questions, please come to Gather Town on A, space A, R, zero, mm -hmm. place. And we will be there. Thank you. Thank you all very much for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.